talking about today. So we're gonna talk about number theory and in particular um, algebra within number theory, how it is that we can make that useful for us. And uh, most of the problems are gonna have a similar theme, but we may practice um, you know, just a little bit of algebra together with our number theory along the way. And let's start with, uh, let me just start with the first problem. The sum of 19 consecutive positive integers equals p cubed for some prime number p. Compute the smallest of the 19 integers. What's a good first step for a problem like this? Uh, simplify it. Simplify. What do you mean by that? In this like case? change it into um numbers instead of words. Ah, okay. Turn the words into math. Sure. Can we turn this into an equation somehow? Um, to solve the nineteen consecutive numbers with x being the smallest. Um, it's x plus, um, it's 19x plus 190. Wait, no. Uh, 171. Okay, so now we have a Diophantine equation. What's a Diophantine equation? Um, don't know. A Diophantine equation is one where the variables represent integers. Oh. What do we know about the left-hand side of this equation? Um, so multiple of 19. Yes. Multiple multiples of 19. So it's 19. So what does that tell us? P has to be 19. One of the yeah. factors of P has to be 19. P has to be 19. Can't be no possible value because the right because 19 divides P cubed. Okay, so P is 19. What does that mean? So nineteen times twenty eight. Nineteen um, times twenty eight. Wait, no. Um, um is it three fifty two? Three fifty two is the correct answer. Yeah, x is equal to. 19 squared minus 9, and 19 squared is 361. So we wind up with 352 as our answer. Okay, good. So 
we're going to talk about the elements of this problem and then we're going to talk about a slightly simpler solution. Um, big element of this problem is thinking in terms of prime factorization within an equation that involves um, algebraic variables. And this is what I mean when I say factoring is factoring. Uh, that when you have prime factorization and algebraic factorization involved, uh, that actually constrains the variables. Otherwise, an equation like this would be much, much harder to think about, right? Yeah. A cubed is cubic. Uh, the other side is linear, two variables. Um, on the other hand, by, by deducing that 19 needed to be a divisor of both sides, we were able to make very significant progress. That's yeah. the theme of the problems that we're working on today. So now at this point, um, I, I said, hey, we're gonna look at a simpler solution. Um, sums and averages are related to each other, right? If you have in oh, numbers. Oh, find the middle one. Yeah, exactly. If this is 19x. If we let m equal the middle term, and you've already figured out that the average of the numbers is the middle term. And then we just get 19 times m equals p cubed. And then it's, it's even a little bit easier to deduce that the fact that 19 must be a divisor of both sides. One thing to remember about equations is, um, you know, in some cases it's, it's best to look at the properties of each side and say, well, look, if these two things are equal, then the properties of one side are the properties of the other. And that may not be something that we're used to deliberately thinking oh. about because we just think about rebalancing and solving most of the time. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, especially when we're dealing with integers, that's one of our good options. Okay. So moving forward, um, let's jump to number three. It's an old AMC 12 problem. How can we get started with this one? Factor 45. One of them has to be a 1. How come? Because there's 3 squared times 5. And there's the 5 part, you need a 1. 6 minus 1 equals 5. Okay. Um, talk me through that again. I mean, um, you know, over here, you know, what, what, what about the left-hand side tells us that we need a 1 on the right-hand side? What is it that we're trying to do with the right-hand side? Um, uh, trying to split into five distinct numbers. Okay, yeah, it's got to be the product of five distinct integers. What are those integers? Um, three, three, wait, three, negative three, five, one, negative one. Yeah, I'm gonna say plus or minus five for the moment, and then one and negative one. And then we should, you know, just to be sure, we say, what is the sign of this one? And it turns out that a negative would make the product negative. And yeah. So so it's got to be positive. Or maybe it is negative 5. I don't know. Why couldn't it be negative 5? Uh, it could be. No. Positive, yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe the product is negative, though. Why couldn't it be negative? Because if it's negative, the whole thing is negative. What's wrong with that? It has to be 45, not negative 45. Right. No, why, why can't it be negative 45? Mm, because the question is positive 45. Oh, oh, okay, okay. All right, I'll buy that. I, I was thinking that we could negate the, the other side. Uh, 
Either way, if it was multiple choice, you will only find one of the answers, so. That's true. Yeah. So now, what do we do? Um, find the difference of those between like, the distance, basically. Okay. It's all the odd numbers up to nine. Positive odd numbers. They are consecutive, aren't they? Yeah. Is that a coincidence? Um, I don't know. May have been a random coincidence. Actually, I, I think that, that uh, the author did intend to pick numbers that were close to zero so that they could do plus minus. Uh, so what's our answer? Um, 25. Yeah, and how'd you come up with that? Five squared. Since it's, um, there are five consecutive ones, so it's just five squares. Okay, here's another thought. The sum is just five, right? Because the pluses and minuses cancel out. Yeah. So the left-hand side is 30 minus the sum of the variables. So we can get the sum is 25 that way as well. Okay, good work. Okay. Um, this relates less to most of what we're doing, but it's a good problem to walk through. I like this one. We want this to be a perfect square. Um. Could just be zero, but that's probably not the largest. Right, the zero does work. No, no, it does. Oh, since it's add one. Yep. All right, we'd have one more than a perfect square. Twelve. Why do you think twelve? Um, since it's since you can make two to eleven, two to three plus two to the eighth. Okay, so we can factor out two to the eighth power. Let's assume that n is at least eight. If we can find an answer, of course, we don't have to check any lower. So we factor out two to the eighth power, which is itself a square. And we've got two to the n minus eight plus two cubed plus two to the zero and two to the third plus one. Uh, well, that means we've That's got nine. two to the eight times two to the n minus eight plus nine. So this stuff in the middle needs to itself be a perfect square. Okay. So two to the n minus eight plus nine equals some integer squared. Could be 16 plus 
He's like, here's the principle I want you to think about. Try to make something factorable. Hmm. What could we rearrange to make something factorable in this Diophantine equation? Um, uh, I don't know. Tell me about the terms, each one of them. Go from left to right. Um, 2 to the n minus 8, and it has to be at least, like, greater than an 8, and 9 is odd, so then k squared must be odd, too. Okay, so you focused first on 2 to the n minus 8, and you were able to make some statements about it. Okay, what do you know about 9 that's interesting? It's 3 squared. Okay, does that relate to k squared in any way? Um, it's 3 squared. And k is 5. Uh, okay, so you have an intuitive guess. Wait, why would uh, k need to be 5? Um, there's the 3, 4, 5 right triangle thing. 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. Okay, you have one solution, but how do you know that there aren't any more? Um... What can we do now? Take the square root of both sides. The square root? Wait, no. Um, I don't know what to do from here. There, then. What can we do with the right hand side? Um, it has to be even then. I don't know what to do with the right hand side. K squared minus three squared. What can you do with that? Um, Close your eyes for a moment. Clear your mind. You, you, have, uh, you have thoughts in the front of your brain that are interfering with new thoughts coming in. Close okay. your eyes. Let those thoughts drain out. Now open them back up and take a look at this with new eyes. What can you do with k squared minus 3 squared? Try to factor it. Yeah, you know how to factor that. How does it factor? Um. Oh, k plus three times k minus three. Good. There you go. So now we have the left hand side of the equation is a power of two, and the right hand side is the product of two integers that are six apart. Okay. So what's true about each one of these factors? It must be a power of two. Yeah. Because that's all that can be in their prime factorization. Yeah. So two powers of two that are six apart. What does that tell us? Um, two apart. 
So it's five. I don't. That is true, but I want us to, to have a full understanding as to why it couldn't be any larger, right? Because our goal is to make this as large as possible. We want these powers of two to be as large as possible. But here's the thing, those powers of two are six apart. Um. So there's six apart. What happens with powers of two as they grow? Um, they're twice as much. Yeah, the differences between each consecutive pair of them is also growing at the same rate. Oh. What does that mean? Wait, so K, um, six in between? Yeah, but in particular, if, you know, if the powers of two are going to be any higher than eight, the difference between any two of them would be at least eight. Oh, so if any of them are more than eight, the difference of them are, are greater than eight? So we can't have any that are bigger than eight here. Oh, so the biggest must be five plus three since it's equal to eight. Yeah, these two numbers here are, can be at most eight and two. And that gives us k equals five. And, uh, but in particular, that, what does that give us for n? That gives us n equals 12, because we'd have to have four total powers of two. So that is our answer. And one thing I want to point out too is, um, we might have even been able to see that intuitively, not that this would have been enough to solve the problem, but you know, two to the n power plus two times two to the 10th plus two to the eighth, right? Can you see a way to make that into a perfect square trinomial? Um, um, so then that means it's two to the twelfth. Yeah. And yeah, the two to the eighth is, yeah, the square of two to the fourth and two to the 10th would come from two to the fourth and two to the sixth. So we can back out that six right there. Okay, let's take a look at number six. What would we like to be able to do with these equations? Um, get rid of the a, b, a times b, b times c, and c times d. Maybe, if only it were that easy. I don't know if there's any way to just get rid of those. Or factor the equations. If we could factor, that would be great. Did the left-hand sides factor? Um. I don't think there is an easy way to factor it. What would factors of this look like? 
suppose we could factor it. Let's just imagine the positive. That sure, we can factor this. We have an A times a B, but then we have A and B alone. There's no squares. We need A alone, so we need for one of these factors to have an A, don't we? Yes. Okay. Well, if the A is separate from the B, where can we put a B in order to get A times B? The second part. Oh, it's A plus 1 times B plus 1. Well, A plus 1 times B plus 1. What does that equal? Oh, there's an equals 5 to 5. Sorry? It's... Oh, it's supposed to be 525 five, since there's an extra plus 1. Okay, A plus B plus A plus B plus 1. So, what does that teach us? All the other ones can be factored like that? Well, well, the first one, we haven't factored the left-hand side yet. What, what is it that we need to do with the first equation? Um, add factor. sides and then factor. Say again? Add one to both sides and then factor it. Add one to both sides. Good. Now the first equation becomes A plus one times B plus one. And let's go ahead and prime factor the right-hand side, 525. Um... Five cubed times, wait, no. Three times five squared times seven. Good. Now the second equation. B plus one times C plus one equals 147. How does 147 factor? Uh, invisible by Three times seven squared. Now the third equation. Um, C squared times D squared. D squared times D squared? Okay, C, C plus one times D plus one. C plus one times D plus one. And how do we factor 105? Three times five times seven. Okay. Now we have a nice looking system of equations. The first one and the third one only vary by five. That's true. What does that tell us? Well, maybe those aren't the two easiest to compare. Yeah. Um, uh, They are all odd. True. But A and B and C and D have to be even then? That's true. Wait, didn't they give us one more restriction kind of thing? A, B, C, D is equal to 8 factorial up there? True. Well then where did the 7 and the odd ones go? Then, oh, smooth one. Um. Focus on the prime factorizations. We've done the algebraic factoring part. 
our goal with these problems is to learn to compare the algebraic factorizations, well, to sometimes to create the algebraic factorizations, but then to compare them to the prime factorizations, right? These four numbers right here are put together two at a time in these equations, and we see the resulting prime factorizations. Uh. Um, does 24 times 20 times 6 times 14 equal 8 factorial? Let's randomly put some numbers together. I, I'm not sure, but uh, I think we have a much simpler route in front of us. We have these four factors, A plus 1, B plus 1, C plus 1, and D plus 1. We know that a plus 1 and b plus 1 together have a 3, two fives, and a 7. But then when we pair b plus 1 with... Oh, so b plus 1 has to have a 3 and a 7. So uh, that's what kind of what I did. Wait a, and minute, then... wait, a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't think that's true. Let's slow down. Now that the, first, the first two of these together have a 3 two fives, and a seven. Then the next two together have one three between them and two sevens. And then the next two together have a three, a five, and a seven. So let's slow down. Let's put our logic brain on. B is three times seven. B plus one is three times seven. So you think that... Um, Multiplied it out and it was eight factorial. When I multiply it out, A, B, C, and D. Did you find a set of solutions? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, okay, you're saying, okay, so here's the way that, um, just, I, I just want to walk through this. The five squared cannot be in B plus one. How come? Since B plus one times C plus one doesn't have a five squared, right. a five in it. Right then uh, b plus 1 times c plus 1 has 7 squared. But we can't have a factor with 7 squared in it. Why so not? c 7 and b is 3 times 7? If either b plus 1 or c plus 1 had both of those factors of 7, then we would see 7 squared elsewhere in oh. a product involving one of those terms. So each oh, one split. has a 7. And but then the three. this five is not in C plus one because it's not in the middle product. So it must belong to B plus one. And now we just have to figure out how it is. You know, there are multiple ways that the threes could show up. You know, either we put that as a factor of B plus one and D plus one, or it's a factor of A plus one and C plus one. Either one is possible. But I kind of used a little bit of extra logic um three times five squared is just really big and i don't think that's where it would be in like the range of the numbers so three just went to b plus one that's pretty good um a little bit more airtight would be to say uh three times five squared is 75 and one less than that is 74 which has a power which has a factor of 37 which isn't going to be an eight factorial so you are right that the three goes with B plus one, and so the other three must go with D plus one. Yay. Now we've, we've parsed everything out. So, Who are you looking for? What were you looking for in the original question? Uh, what did they ask for? Um, a minus D. I think they uh, they asked for something that you couldn't plug in easily for. And um, so is C just seven minus one? Yeah. And then D is fourteen. Okay. Good. So A minus D is ten, and that's our answer. 
and I'm going to check the answer key, and that is correct. Okay. <sighs> By the way, I just want to point this out. This idea of adding one, when we have a product and then a linear combination, whether it's one times each variable or anything else, the idea of adding a constant to make it factor, we call this Simon's favorite factoring trick. Oh, isn't it kind of completing the square kind of? It is kind of like that, yes. Um, and sometimes you'll see this abbreviated SFFT. If you're ever on the AOPS forums or something like that. Um, and oh. Because uh, Simon was uh, working for us there one summer when he pointed out that this was his favorite factory trick, so we decided yeah. to leave it after him. I saw the video thingy. It was kind of weird. And now you're learning to apply it in problems. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at number four. Four digit primes. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds scary already, doesn't it? Huge. <laughs> but then how do you make sure they are prime? We'll see. That's just strange. How can we get started with this beast? Um, try to factor it. Seems reasonable. How can we factor it next to the 12th plus y to the 12th? Plus 2 times y, x to the 6 times y to the 6. Say again? Um, uh, Add two times x to the six times y to the six. If you've got a proposed factorization, check it out and see if it works. In the meantime, I'm going to grab me another cup of coffee while you work on that. Okay. So do you have any ideas on this one? No. Okay, you started, it sounded like you were trying to factor a sum of squares at first. But a sum of squares is a factor. And I got it. x squared plus y squared doesn't have any uh, factoring roots. Squares are at least zero, which keeps us from being able to create a zero without just making both variables equal to zero. So there are no factors that could be simpler that could be equal to zero. Um, so sum of squares doesn't work. What does work? What is a sum of powers that you've factored before? Um. Cubics? Yes, a sum of cubes can be factored. Yeah. And we could look at x, x to the 12 plus y to the 12 as x fourth cubed plus y to the fourth cubed. Um, Let's remind ourselves, um, how does 
X to the fourth Y to the How does that factor? A plus A plus B times A squared minus A B plus B squared. Yeah. Okay. So how does seven to the twelfth plus four to the twelfth begin to factor? Seven to the fourth plus um four to the fourth times seven to the eighth minus seven to the fourth times four to the fourth plus four to the eighth. Good. And now we know that this is the product of three four digit primes. I assume that seven to the fourth plus four to the fourth is a prime. We could at least try it. What's seven to the fourth power? I do not remember. I did not remember that. Two four zero one. Four to the fourth. Two fifty six. Looks prime. Definitely greater than twenty six twenty six. Suspiciously slightly greater than twenty six twenty six. It looks prime. Uh, it looks could be deceiving. Um, it's not a multiple of two, three, or five. We can figure that out pretty quickly. But uh, we also know it's not a multiple of seven because it's seven to the fourth plus four to the fourth, and four to the fourth is not a multiple of seven. So we can start with 11. How far would we need to test up to? Um, about like the square root halfway mark. So the multiplicative halfway mark, perhaps. Uh, this is around 51.5. Man, that's still a lot of primes to test. It's a lot of primes, isn't it? I think it's prime. Yeah, I think it's prime. <laughs> well, either it's prime or it's going to be the product of, of two or three primes or something like that. Um, why don't we just back those? Why don't we just solve for the other part? And if they, it is bigger than two, six, two, six, then we try solving. That. Well, I'll point this out. Uh, this is the product of three four digit primes. If this thing factors, therefore it must factor into numbers that are four digits or higher. So we can go ahead and just call it a day. We don't have to go through the slog here. No. I was really just teasing you. Okay, moving forward. Let's try an end problem. Wait, was it prime? Yeah, it is prime. <laughs> but once in a while, a problem will, will imply something like that about the answer so that you don't have to do that much grind work. They're more testing as to whether or not you can think in terms of factorization. Isn't that X plus Y cubed? No, no, it's not it.
So let's talk about one of the uh, grand principles of factoring and equation solving. It's called take everything and jam it on one side. Oh, that's fun. Why do we do that? Why do we take everything and jam it on one side? It's, it's going to equal zero. Why is that important? So then you could factor. And then one of the stuff has to be equal to zero. Yeah, because, yeah, if we can factor it, then now we're solving simpler equations. We're solving stuff one equals zero and stuff two equals zero. And if either one of them equals zero, then their product equals zero. Yeah. And so that's not the way this problem is going to turn out, however. But that's okay. The, the general principle still helps us. If we take everything and jam it on one side, and I'm going to organize the terms a little bit differently because I always find it helpful to write everything from highest to lowest powers because it's easier to organize, whether it's factoring or anything else, it's a little bit easier to organize and see things in a systematic way. Um, what does this remind you of? Some square. Wait, isn't it y squared? Three x squared y squared? Yes. Pardon? I was being accosted by a monster. Huh. Uh. Don't know. Can can you factor that? If we were to try, what would need to be in one factor versus the other? There has to be an X and a Y in both stuff one and stuff two. There has to be an X and a Y in both? Why would that be true? Wait. No? To get the X squared and Y squared? Okay. You could have X, Y in both terms. But you know, we don't see any kind of like x, y out there on its own. But we do see an x squared and a y squared out there on their own. Could it put x squared and y squared on one side of the equation on one stuff? Both of them into the same factor? Yes. We want them alone, and we want them in a product together. Yeah. We've seen this today. X plus Y. Oh, X squared plus Y. X squared plus one, Y squared plus one. Okay, you're on the right track. It's it's not going to be x squared plus one and y squared plus one. Wait, three x uh, squared y squared term. Three x squared plus blank um, times y squared minus ten. Okay, good. You you put the three with the x squared. How come? Um, since you need the negative thirty x squared. Yeah, and y is y squared is just a loan. In the product. Yeah. So you said y has minus 10? Is that what you said? To make that yes, minus to get the negative 30. But then don't you you have to plus one? And there's gonna be extra there's gonna be some stuff out of this stuff. Okay. This product is equal to three x squared y squared minus thirty x squared plus y squared minus 10 minus 10 okay minus 507 what do we have to do on both sides of the original equation is is add what um split 517 into 507 and 5 and 10 okay so we need to add 507 to both sides and that gives us yeah. 3x squared plus 1 times 
y squared minus 10 equals, what do we do with 507? Factor it, it's divisible by three. It is divisible by three. Three times 13 squared. That's right. Okay. Uh, did we try to find x squared and y squared? Yeah, th this gets, uh, this. This is more of a test of your playful creativity skills, or um, there's a little bit we could do perhaps with modular arithmetic. If you know some modular arithmetic facts, like, you know, what does a square look like modulo this or that those could help, but you're probably just going to find the answer playing around. You need to divide a, you know, parcel out one power of three, two powers of 13 into two factors. Tell me when you can do it and make those work. Oh, x equals 2 and y equals 7. Okay. So they, could, three. They, they could be negative also, but it, it won't matter for our question. It's x squared and y squared. So what's our final answer? Uh, 2, 8, Two eight eight. No, five eight eight. Pardon, I have an animal who likes to bite me while I'm teaching. I'm gonna throw him out. Okay, what'd you come up with as a final answer? Five. Five eight eight. Five eighty eight. Yeah. And you know, probably the easiest thing is to notice this factor can't have the three, so we've got to put the three in there. And if we multi, you know, it, you know, this would be uh, y squared would be thirteen if it's only that. So we try to throw in a power of thirteen, maybe two, but just one of them works. And uh, you know, yeah, and three times thirteen over here and thirteen over here gives us an answer of. 3x squared, y squared, 3 times 2 squared times 7 squared. That is 588. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's, I think we have time for one more here. Can we all input this? Uh, which one are we going to do? Let's take a look at 14. Wait, does the end solutions x and y have to be the same as the x and y in the equation, or are they different? I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh, oh never mind. Okay, I got it. Uh, Sometimes just trying to put a question into words is a good way to answer it for yourself. Yeah. Uh, 
Now this thing is big enough and ugly enough that if you don't have much experience with something quite so big and ugly, it might just be worth asking, what can we do? Do you remember, do you, um, remember all four of my favorite problem solving questions? Um, what can we do? What is ugly and what is nice? And what can we do about it? Yeah. What's interesting or nice? What's ugly? What's the obstacle? Those are the first two. Those, those are, uh, we, we apply those just constantly. Um, but when okay. the going gets tougher, we ask, what can we do? Or what is the definition of this thing? I don't think what is the definition is, is quite so important to us this time, but asking what can we do? And uh, a reasonable attempt is to try to do what? Factor it. And it seems reasonable to try to factor this. And we ask, what would factors look like if we could, or even come close to factoring this? What do you uh, see in here that gives us some hints? The x squared and y squared and the 2xy. Okay. This stuff right here is x plus y times x plus y. Okay. What else do you see that might be helpful? All of the remaining terms are just minus, are just minus, 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 minus. That's true. We can account for the signs. Factor out with negative one. Okay. Now what? Uh, they have to equal each other. That's true. Um, I would rather have factors whose product is equal to zero. So I like keeping everything on one side if possible. Let's try to go down that line of reasoning or that, that hope before it is that we try to turn this into comparing two sides. I don't think those are going to be easy to compare at all if we do that. But um, Factor m out of factor an m out of the second part is separate of one. Okay. We see m times x plus y plus one if we want the one in there. But you know what? We see this x, y. Should we keep them grouped together? You know, if we're trying like factoring by grouping. I don't think you should put the one in there. You should leave out the plus m. Maybe not. Perhaps we just want m times x plus y and then plus m plus one. And, you know, we might look at either of these and, and ask ourselves, could we use either of those? But I, I like that x plus y there because we have an x plus y times x plus y. And we have an x plus y times x plus y and then we have other x plus y stuff, what does that tell us about how we might construct two factors? x plus y minus m times x plus y. Well, certainly x plus y on both sides, that accounts for all of that stuff right there. Now we want x plus y times minus m. So well, we also want to get a minus m plus one somehow. So we want minus m in total. <laughs> multiplied by those two things, but we also want to wind up with a product of minus m minus one or minus m plus one. Do you see it? Yeah. What do we do? So minus m has to go on one or the other side. One of, one of the factors has to go on the other side. So tell me, what am I putting in the left side? What am I putting in the right? Um, the left side could include a minus m, and then the right side is 
plus one. Tell me if that works. Wait, no, you still need the extra plus one in there. You're very, very close here. Right, this does not give you a product of minus m plus one. In fact, it doesn't give you minus m times x plus y. It gives you minus m plus one times x plus y. Because you multiply that minus m by the x plus one and you multiply that one by the x plus one. So you oh. might get what you wanted. You're real, real close. Plus m, plus one on the left side of the factor, left factor. Wait, plus one minus m, and then on the right side, plus one. Wait, minus one on the right side. Okay, minus one on the right side and one on the left side? My, plus one minus m. One on the right hand side? Minus one. Gosh, you're, you're still, you're very close. Uh, I don't know then. Uh, or maybe you've got it. No, there's an I create there's an extra plus M. Wait, switch the positive one and the negative one. Switch the positive one and the negative one? Oh, did you say switch them? Yeah. That's right. That does multiply out to the original equation. And now let's go back and look at what the problem asked us to do. It says prove that this equation has exactly m solutions and positive integers. Okay, positive integers. X and Y are positive integers, and the product of these two factors equals zero. Minus. Sorry, your voice went out on me. Say again. Oh. X plus Y minus one minus M equals zero. Right. Yeah, X plus Y plus one. This cannot equal zero when x and y are positive integers. So we know, we know that x plus y minus one minus m equals zero, which means that x plus y equals m plus one. And x and y are positive integers. So what are the solutions? Um, m and one, m minus one and two, m minus two and three and dot, dot, dot. Yeah, and in total we have m ordered pairs of positive integers, x, y, that are solutions to that seven term Diophantine equation, multivariable Diophantine equation. That was weird. <laughs> You feel accomplished? Yes. Good, good, we went through a lot today.